Okay, everybody got that? Who wanted it? No one screaming no, so I take that as a yes. Okay, so we'll get started. Uh, this is the automated OpenStack deployment comparison talk. Uh, you'll find my email address uh, at the bottom of the slide here. Uh, my name is Florian. I run Hastexo. We're a professional services company that provides consulting and training services around OpenStack, among other things. Um, you'll find my personal Twitter handle there. You'll find the company Twitter, ha Twitter handle there. Uh, if you look for a hidden meaning or any code in either, you'll fail. There is none. So there's one thing I'd like to get out of the way, first and foremost. If you were ever under the delusion that it's a great idea to deploy OpenStack manually from packages and then hacking them by hand, just don't do so. Please, just don't. Don't do that. Whatever you do, you want to deploy OpenStack in an automated and repeatable fashion. Another thing I want to get out of the way is that contrary to what some salespeople might like to tell you, there is no one true way to deploy OpenStack. There is no one way that everyone in the community and outside this community has agreed on. This is the key way or the, the, the standard way of deploying OpenStack. There are several. In fact, because in, a, in the OpenStack community, we have a relatively unique situation that pretty much every vendor ships the same code as far as the platform itself is concerned. So vendors have a really hard time differentiating on code alone. If you're a software company and you're not able to differentiate on the code you ship, that is something that shareholders tend not to like. So therefore, and this is not a bad thing, by the way, uh, and therefore, you're going to have to expect your OpenStack vendors to differentiate in another way. If they can't actually differentiate on the base of the code they ship, then they're going to differentiate uh, in a different way. And uh, in OpenStack's case, it's deployment automation that is actually a key differentiator for OpenStack vendors. And um, what that means is that very few OpenStack vendors actually ship a deployment automation scheme that is identical to that of the next vendor over. And that, for you as an OpenStack user, as an OpenStack deployer, or as an OpenStack administrator, means that you must, yourself, you must ask yourself two questions specific to your use case and your organization. First one is, which is your preferred distro vendor? Do you already have one? Do you have a working relationship with a specific distro vendor that you're happy with and you'd like to maintain and keep that, uh, that relationship? If that is the case, then that is something that is going to influence your choice of OpenStack product and as such is going to influence your choice of deployment automation. Or you might look at it from a different perspective, which is what's your preferred deployment automation system? Are you a puppet shop? Are you a chef shop, an Ansible shop, a Juju shop? Um, which of these is the one that is preferred? Um, and if you're very much locked in on one of these systems, then that is probably also going to define your choice of OpenStack vendor, or at least limit your available choices of OpenStack vendors. And it's also entirely up to you or up to your organization which of these two takes precedence. So if you have a very good working relationship with, say, Red Hat, but you're a 100% puppet shop, um, then you're simply going to have to make a decision whether you want to go with something that is based on Puppet or you want to go with Red Hat's product. And that's not a decision that anyone can make for you. It's something that you have to make in your organization and on your team. Another thing that I want to mention for this talk is the fact that this talk is an overview and it is not a technical deep dive. You'll find plenty of technical deep, deep dives uh, in this conference. Um, but this is not one of them. This is intended to give you an overview of the options that you have available and, dif and discuss the pros and cons of each. Um, and finally, uh, a bit of a warning. A strong opinions ahead. Um, so I'm not going to worry too much about you know, not ticking anyone off. I'm trying to give uh, as frank and, and, an opinion um, about sort of the various topics that I'm talking about. So with that, we're going to get rolling. And the first uh, vendor that I'm going to talk about relatively randomly, uh, the first vendor that I'm going to talk about is Red Hat. Um, and when we talk about Red Hat's deployment automation or the deployment of OpenStack based on Red Hat products, It 
it's a bit of a never-ending story. Um, because if we look at the history of Red Hat's um, OpenStack deployment automation, if you look back a few years, uh, it was like, okay, uh, we've got this thing called PackStack. This is what we're going to use. Um, it's based on Puppet, wonderful, and that's how you're going to deploy OpenStack. And then, actually, no. Uh, back up a bit, and back, Packstack was always just a proof of concept, and we're going to do something completely different. So then, and this was around the Rel OSP 6 time frame, it was all Foreman and Puppet. So now you would go from the sort of agentless Puppet operation that Packstack was to something that was not only also Puppet based, but also included uh, bare metal automation. Uh, multi-node orchestration, that sort of thing. Except they came up with something else. This is where we are now, um, and the default deployment stack for Rel OSP 7 is called OSP Director based on RDO Manager, and that in turn uses Triple O and Ironic for deployment and also bare metal orchestration and so forth. So this is the final word in Red Hat OpenStack deployment, perhaps, because, right? So we'll simply see whether we're in for another iteration of, uh, of OpenStack deployment on Red Hat. With that said, a very quick overview of sort of the general process of how you deploy OpenStack on Relos P7, that is to say, the currently available, uh, the currently available product. So Relos P7 uses this concept called uh, OSP Director, and uh, your general process there is you first bootstrap everything by installing your director node. So that is basically your seed node, your core node that you use for deploying everything else. Uh, on that thing, you have to create a director user. You have to create uh, image and template directories. You register the system with Red Hat Subscription Manager that enables all of the OpenStack uh, repos, or that makes them available to you. You then enable them, and then you install your director packages. Now, one thing that's interesting here, and that's actually sort of a bit of a difference between Red Hat and the other products that I'm going to talk about, is this stuff actually plugs itself into the unified OpenStack client as a plugin, which is relatively neat. So they don't actually ship their own, their completely own freestanding stuff. They, they, they ship something that, is, that integrates itself with the OpenStack uh, client. Um, so that's actually fairly neat. What you then do, remember, this is triple O. Triple O is OpenStack on OpenStack. And what you're defining is effectively two layers of OpenStack sitting on one another. The bottom layer is called the undercloud. And the undercloud you effectively configure on your director node. That's the stuff that then, of course, manages your images, your templates, and so forth for the bare metal deployment of your nodes. In order to do that, of course, you have to fetch and install images for what then become uh, what then becomes your overcloud, and that's basically your second step. The next thing that you install is, in effect, your overcloud. I should say that uh, Red Hat deserves massive kudos for the quality of their documentation. The documentation is extremely extensive and very detailed. Um, and it doesn't only include, you know, helpful overviews like this one, which is a very nice, you know, graphical explanation of what they expect your network to look like. Um, but it also has very, very good detailed step-by-step -step, um, documentation for how you actually deploy this stuff. Um, so that's, that's a, a, a real, you know, nice positive note there. Um, you have several options for actually installing your overcloud. And some of them, or actually one of them, is GUI driven, and the other options are CLI driven. You have the option to deploy what Red Hat calls a test overcloud, and that enables you to actually run the entire installation through a web UI, and the web UI is essentially Tusker. Now, um, however, Red Hat themselves say, well, actually, that is something that you should only be using for testing. 
and for proper use, you would either deploy a basic over cloud using CLI tools, and the CLI that you use is obviously either Ironic or if you prefer the OpenStack, uh, the OpenStack integrated uh, or unified client, that would be OpenStack Bare Metal. And then you can also do what, uh, what Red Hat calls the advanced over cloud. That's another thing that you can only deploy with CLI tools, but that includes handy features like um, Ceph storage, um, better HA support, and, and so forth. Now, it remains to be seen how this progresses in the future, because what you would, of course, want to have is features to deploy basic and advanced over clouds with a UI as well. We'll see whether they're going to expand on the path that they are now, or go back to square one and rewrite everything in Ansible. We will see. That much for Red Hat. Another vendor that I want to talk about is Ubuntu, an Ubuntu uh, OpenStack. Their default deployment stack consists of Juju for application orchestration, Maz for bare metal, uh, deployment, and then landscape as sort of an overarching Uber management that is web-based. There, your deployment checklist or your deployment walkthrough looks remarkably similar. You're going to find that what I'm talking about here basically step by step in concept actually is very similar from vendor to vendor. The first thing that you do there is you install your mass server. Um, and uh, MAS is effectively equivalent to what in Red Hat is the director node, what in SUSE is the admin node, what in, in, um, in Mirantis is the fuel master node. So that's the first thing that you do. Basically, what you, uh, that's a very simple package install, more or less. So you add a few repositories um, and you install the MAS package. What you can then do is you can wire up MAS to talk to Landscape, Landscape being a web-based server management um, environment. And uh, there is an OpenStack installer. You can basically plug that into Landscape uh, as you go. And then you can use Landscape itself uh, to deploy OpenStack, to actually install your OpenStack environment. Right? And then that basically gives you sort of this, this web-based interface which you can use for deploying and managing your OpenStack nodes. If you don't like landscape, which is entirely fine, uh, if you don't like the idea of uh, working with a web-based management interface, but you, and instead you want sort of everything to talk locally, to stick uh, within, stay within your firewall, there is also the ability to use the OpenStack uh, multi-installer or multi-system installer. Um, there's also a single system option, but, uh, which doesn't require mass, but that basically um, assumes that everything runs on the same node in Lexi containers. If you don't, if you, for some reason you don't like MAS either, then you can actually use Juju in a manual mode as well, which is you basically manually add nodes to your, uh, to your Juju environment. And effectively getting Juju up and running is a very, very simple thing. You basically run Juju Bootstrap, and then you Juju deploy your charms as you go along. Now, uh, one thing that I like personally about uh, Juju deployment, and that's a concept that you're also going to see in, um, in Rackspace Private Cloud, a concept that is also emerging in Fuel, is the ability to deploy any server, any charm, that, any Juju charm that you wish to a container, to an LXC container. Um, and effectively what that enables you to do is you can run, say for example, a three node high availability cluster, so three, um, three physical nodes that you use for your OpenStack control nodes and then every single charm, every single service will, on each of those three nodes, deploy one container that basically forms one third of the cluster. And this is something that actually works really, really beautifully, um, albeit with a few limitations. So one such limitation is in, um, up until very recently, up until uh, 
MAS 1.8 and before the before MAS 1.9. Um, all of what Ubuntu did there considered itself very, very little with network management. Uh, that is changing, so you had very little ability to manage you know, bonds, VLANs, routes, and so forth. And as a result, there was also very little such support in Juju. And if you think about it, one thing that you might want to be able to do is if you, for example, deploy Cinder to LXC containers, if that LXC container only has a single network interface, that's generally fine, but if you are deploying, say, for example, in conjunction with Ceph, which this also supports very beautifully, um, then you might want to actually bridge your Cinder LXC container with like one leg into your Ceph storage network. That would be helpful, right? But that's coming and that's, that's evolving um, as, it, as it goes along. This has been, so Juju has provided actually a remarkable degree of stability um, in terms of actually sticking to a single tool. Um, the same thing, by the way, is true for Susan. Again, we're talking about a completely different deployment stack. So we talked about uh, OSP Director and Triple O. We talked about uh, Maz and Juju. And in SUSE, it happens to be Crowbar and Chef. Um, Remember, Crowbar originally came out of Dell, has the unique distinction of being uh, the software project with the scariest mascot on Earth. Um, and that's basically a bare metal deployment facility, and that hooks in with uh, Chef for actual service and uh, application automation. Again, a relatively similar approach to the one that we saw in Red Hat, and in, and in Ubuntu, which is one thing that you need is you basically need your seed node that you then deploy everything else from, and in Chef Parlance, that's called the admin node. So this is something that, you know, if you're familiar with SUSE, you're going to expect uh, all of this stuff to be configurable from YAST, and of course, this is. Um, and you basically go through a few steps there, and then you run a script, called install SUSE Cloud, and then off you go, and at the end you have um, your dashboard. Um, one thing, one specific um, concept that SUSE caters to that the others that I've previously talked about don't is what if you don't like actually deploying to the bare metal? What if you don't like actually bootstrapping your nodes like pretty much from scratch? What if you already have your existing management uh, and deployment interface and whatnot? And what you would instead like to do is um, you might want to uh, actually use an existing machine and then deploy that. And you also have a facility for that with Crowbar Register. If you, which is basically a shell script that Crowbar generates for you that you can then run. If you don't like just installing you know, the whole works of your, of your admin node, there's another thing that's very helpful that you can do, and that's uh, SUSE Studio. For those of you who are not familiar, SUSE Studio is a very, very handy way of building in an automated fashion, effectively appliance images, and then basically being able to tweak them for whether you want to run them on bare metal, on VMware, on uh, KVM, on OpenStack, on whatever. And it's a very, very simple and handy tool for that. And it also allows you to define effectively or use virtual appliances that are available in a gallery. And of course, as it happens, there is also a SUSE OpenStack Cloud 5 admin node that you can use there. Um, and that's basically, you know, you can, if you want to deploy this to the bare metal, you know, you can put this into a USB image that you then IPMI mount and then boot it up or whatever you'd like. Uh, if you want to test this in a virtual environment, then you can do that with an image from there and so forth. So that was the first part, installing the, um, the cloud admin node. Um, the, the second is actually installing your, your cloud nodes. And here we have obviously the ability to do auto discovery. That's something that uh, the others that I've mentioned up to this point uh, can do as well. And then what you can do is you can effectively define 
individual node roles to specific nodes. Um, and then, of course, you know, you can, you can tweak individual services um, and so forth. If you get sick of doing the same thing over and over again for different nodes, there's also a bulk edit mode, which is quite helpful. And then in the end, hopefully, what you'll get is you get a nicely deployed uh, OpenStack environment. One thing that SUSE got, uh, got going for, for themselves is a very, very handy way of deploying OpenStack services in a highly available fashion. That's something that every vendor solves slightly differently. In Juju, for example, what you do is this is effectively expressed as a Juju relation with an HA cluster charm uh, that you can then, through that relation, link to any other uh, charm in the, in the system. Sorry. That's all right. <laughs> <laughs> um, and what you can do in SUSE is you basically can pull and drag services onto something that you have previously defined as a cluster and it will just magically reconfigure itself to become a highly available service as opposed to when you just drag it onto a node then it will deploy itself as a non-highly available system. And the other thing that I've already mentioned is the ability to use crowbar register um, and crowbar register is effectively a shell script that crowbar generates for you that allows you to register previously existing and previously installed uh, nodes effectively SLES nodes that are already installed and configured and register those for SUSE cloud deployment and then finally of course uh, the last thing is you deploy your OpenStack services Again, uh, it's basically, it's a pretty nice drag-and-drop interface uh, that, you can, that you can get there. Um, and the individual items here in Juju parlance are called charms. In Crowbar parlance, they're called bar clamps. And, um, and here's such an example of where, so here previously, you had individual bar clamps deployed to individual nodes. And here's another example where, uh, rather than deploying to individual nodes, you're actually deploying to clusters, basically using the same kind of drag and drop method, which is really kind of handy. And the fourth vendor that I want to talk about is Rackspace, uh, specifically uh, Rackspace Private Cloud, or I think as they call it now, Rackspace Private Cloud powered by OpenStack, because that just kind of rolls off the tongue better. Um, and they, again, use a different deployment model, and that uh, deployment stack is Ansible. Um, and Rackspace deserve commendation for the fact that they're basically doing all of their stuff, all of their development on this upstream. Um, it used to be on StackForge until StackForge got retired, so now it's under the OpenStack namespace. And um, what Rackspace don't concern themselves with at all is actual bare metal deployment. So um, everything that uh, OSA, the OpenStack Ansible deployment, um, expects is there is an installed Ubuntu 14.04. And how you get there is effectively you know, your problem. But again, what you will typically do is you will install a deployment host um, installing the deployment host is a relatively straightforward process of effectively uh, git cloning a single repo, uh, changing into that repo, and then running a bootstrap script. So for those of you familiar with Ansible, you might ask, uh, well, why can't I do that on like my own laptop? I, mean, I already have Ansible on there. All I need to run is effectively Secure Shell to be able to connect to my hosts. Well, as is unfortunately relatively common among many projects that use Ansible, this thing relies on a specific minimal version of Ansible uh, and a relatively recent one. I believe it's 1914, if I remember correctly. And um, what the Bootstrap Ansible thing will do for you is it will actually install that Ansible for you. Right? Like that or not. I'm not particularly fond of of, 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 of that approach, but well, that's what it is. Then what you want to do is you want to uh, configure your target hosts. That's effectively describing your topology in YAML. 
right? Um, this, by the way, now is not too dissimilar from uh, Red Hat, where you can effectively describe your overcloud in a YAML file. And in SUSE, you also have the ability to describe effectively your topology in YAML and then batch automate your deployment uh, that way. And then finally, what you effectively do is you run your Ansible playbooks um, and, and off you go. Um, there are three in total. One is called the foundation playbook. Then there is the infrastructure playbook. And uh, the, infra the infrastructure playbook, that's an interesting one because um, what the infrastructure playbook does for you, it, it deploys all of the services that OpenStack relies on that are not OpenStack, such as um, uh, MySQL with Galera for high availability, uh, such as RabbitMQ, such uh, as a decent syslog configuration, such as Memcached, and um, Rackspace were the first ones that also gave you the automated ability to install Elk, so Elasticsearch, Lockstash, Kibana, um, directly and fully integrated with OpenStack and, and, uh, and configured for that. And there's other vendors that are, that are doing this now. So apparently, uh, Mirantis are now shipping a fuel plugin uh, for that purpose. Um, and I don't exactly know what Red Hat's plans are uh, in that department. And then finally, uh, you actually run your OpenStack playbook. Um, and that's just called setupopenstack.yaml. And that's your final Ansible playbook that you run. And then you hopefully have uh, a, working, a working OpenStack environment. So. Um, so that's basically my, my, my overview here. Um, if you want to use these slides at any time, you can certainly do so. You can grab them from here. Um, the top one are, is just the, the rendered presentation, and the bottom one uh, are the actual sources, and this stuff is all under a Creative Commons license, so if you uh, feel like reusing it, then please do so. Um, and of course, you know, if you grab the QR code earlier, it's going to lead you to this as well. And if you're curious about um, what our company does about OpenStack, then of course you can also take a look at our website. We have a landing page uh, on OpenStack. And so do take a look there. So when I first did this talk, which was a few months back, uh, the first question I got was, well, okay, so you're, now you're talking about OpenStack deployment, right? And that's fine for getting a feel for how easy it is to get up and running on a specific, with a specific OpenStack environment. Um, but that's not the end of it, right? You want to be able to maintain and upgrade your stuff uh, as well. So I decided to uh, tack on a few, a few slides for that. Um, so the problem is we want to keep abreast of OpenStack releases as they go. If we first deployed our OpenStack cloud on Icehouse, then maybe we'd like to skip Juno um, and then go to Kilo, or maybe we want to do actually every single release upgrade and so forth. So we need a way of doing upgrades. Again, I'm going to take this in the same order. I'm going to start with, uh, with Red Hat. So um, Red Hat's upgrade story, basically getting you from, from OpenStack Icehouse to Juno to Kilo to Liberty to whatever we'll see in the, well, I'm not going to say what we'll see in the next few releases, but what it's been up to this point is, it's basically, oh, well, you don't really need to worry about upgrades because by the time a new OpenStack releases out, we've just completely changed our deployment methodology and therefore you're going to have to respin from scratch anyway. Um, which isn't very enterprisey, I might add. Um, although, of course, you know, there's 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 people that say that the definition of enterprise is running outdated software and paying a lot of you know support for it. That's not the definition that I like. Um, but right now, that's an issue. Um, it is not an easy task getting. Uh, from, say, for example, it was kind of sort of okay to go within Icehouse from um, RHEL 6 to RHEL 7 or CentOS 6, CentOS 7. That was kind of sort of okay. 
But if you deployed your stuff with, um, with the rel OSP installer on rel OSP 7 um, with Icehouse, um, not a good thing. I mean, you're not in a very pretty situation if you deployed with Foreman and Puppet and that's what you built your processes around. So, well, um, Ubuntu actually does remarkably well in that department because upgrades are a means of effectively changing one Juju variable. Um, and you can do that basically on the fly with Juju set, or you can, uh, you can also define effectively a, a YAML configuration of your whole thing, uh, or you can even deploy a Juju bundle, which is basically extensive YAML describing your entire infrastructure. Um, and the, the process is almost fully automatic by just setting basically a single variable. Um, which is available on all the Juju OpenStack charms. It's called OpenStack Origin. Normally, you would do so from Yuka, from the Ubuntu Cloud Archive. Recently, there has, have also been additions to Juju that enable you to actually deploy from Git. Um, the reason I say it's almost fully automatic is that in prior releases, there have always been sort of minor tweaks that you then uh, still had to do. But what's really nice is that this does enable you to run effectively staggered service updates. So that means that you can go through basically charm by charm along effectively the find list that I think we all owe gratitude uh, to CERN for because they f found out what basically the best, um, the best sequence of, of service updates is uh, with OpenStack to cause the least blood, sweat, or tears. Um, and you, what you can do effectively with Juju is you can upgrade you know, every single service separately. And also, it's, it's, uh, it's a very, very easy task to upgrade the charms themselves, so the stuff that actually deploys the services for you. Um, so that's actually pretty neat. Um, with, uh, with SUSE, SUSE OpenStack Cloud also does have um, full support for upgrades. Um, you effectively run a script called uh, SUSE Cloud Upgrade. This has one downside, which is it's effectively a stop the world type upgrade. Um, at least that's what it was from SUSE Cloud 4 to SUSE OpenStack Cloud 5. We'll see how they do in their, uh, in their next release. Uh, what that meant from going from SUSE Cloud 4 to 5 is uh, all your instances had to be suspended. The API services were down uh, for the upgrade. Um, and then you would actually run it and then everything would magically come back up and you would resume your, uh, your VMs. On the Ansible side, um, also support for upgrades. There is effectively a fully automatic uh, upgrade script and um, the expectation there is you have effectively no impact on your VMs. What you will need to take into consideration is that you're always going to have brief API outages. So for a short period of time, you know, your Neutron is going to be unavailable, your Nova is going to be unavailable, um, and, and so forth, but you're not impacting actual running VMs, which is what people are, are typically uh, most interested in. Uh, another thing that I should actually mention about, um, about OpenStack Ansible and the stuff that largely came out of Rackspace, which we're beginning to see as sort of a pattern, is this stuff just deploys into containers by default. So in Juju, that's an option. This stuff just does it by default. We'll see whether that is going to become sort of an accepted best practice of deploying OpenStack services, just a single isolated container uh, for every for every OpenStack service, preferably in high availability configurations such that you can always throw one container away, rebuild, throw the next container away, rebuild, and never actually break um, API availability. Okay, so with that, I am 34 minutes and 30 seconds into my talk, which leaves me five minutes and 30 seconds for questions. So I'd like to open it up now for that, so please fire away. And I do have a Q&A mic, which is not open right now. There we go, that's much better. And what I'll do is I'm just going to throw this to the first person. <laughs> you have a question? 
when is the right time to dirty the hands with the actual configuration files in auto open stack what, what when is the right time to do what to dirty the hands with the actual configuration files. When should you actually get your hands dirty on configuration because files? That if is we install it initially manually, we get a chance to learn the inner yeah. also. Yeah, so so if I if I paraphrase your question correctly, what is the right time to actually get your hands dirty by hacking configuration files? If it's actual OpenStack configuration files, that time is never. But uh, while operating and tr issues do come and do, you do need to troubleshoot, while operating the cloud, various kind of issues come up and yes. they might demand actual knowledge into the configuration files. Yes. Looking into the logs and yes. debugging. Then please contribute to the tool that you're using and send a patch for that. Or work with people who will, who will you know, troubleshoot and debug the issue for you or with you. Yeah, when, yeah, yes. Uh, any particular reason, another question, any particular reason you did not mention fuel from Mirantis? Excellent question. So uh, what about Mirantis? <laughs> <laughs> you can collect your check later, thank you. <laughs> okay. Um, so the only reason I didn't, I didn't include Mirantis here was that uh, I basically had to cut the line somewhere and, and this talk is only 40 minutes, but I did, uh, I did put together a little bit of information about how Mirantis fits into this whole thing. Okay, so what is their, what is their default uh, deployment stack? Um, Mirantis happens to be, as per Red Hat going to OSP director, the only major vendor that still backs Puppet. Um, it's going to be very interesting what that means for uh, Puppet and OpenStack upstream development and particularly for really large shops that rely on, on, on Puppet to deploy. But that's what they use. So Fuel is effectively a glorified uh, Puppet front end and uh, effectively you're using Puppet for, uh, for deployment. The deployment checklist or the, the, the deployment progression is effectively the same or very similar to um, everything else that we've seen. Um, you start out with installing a fuel master node. Uh, that fuel master node you actually deploy to the bare metal. You effectively download an ISO image um, and then something resembling an old style PC BIOS comes up. Um, you, uh, you, 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 you make your, your appropriate um, settings. Interestingly, um, some of the fuel documentation or the fuel documentation says about some of these settings that you're supposed to never change them during the entire life cycle of the cluster. Um, I'm just going to take them on their word for that. I've never tried that out. I just don't know what happens there, but I'm sure there's plenty of Mirantis people who could explain that to us uh, in the hallway. Um, then you boot what Mirantis calls or Fuel calls the node servers. That's Fuel lingo for OpenStack nodes. Um, they effectively pixie boot, they install Ubuntu 14.04 for you, and then Mirantis OpenStack on top of that. Um, in uh, Fuel 6.1, there was still support for running CentOS 6 on the OpenStack nodes or on the node servers. Uh, that support has apparently been removed in Fuel 7. Then you get a nice and handy um, uh, and, and, and shiny web interface that you can use to, to deploy your stuff. It's a pre-flight check and so forth. One thing that's somewhat unusual or peculiar perhaps about Fuel is that there is a bunch of functionality that is not sort of in Fuel core, but is made available through plugins. Now, some of these plugins, you generally would expect them to be third-party plugins, like for example, support for Metonet, support for Juniper Contrail, support for SolidFire and so forth. So stuff that actually comes from a third-party vendor and that where that vendor actually writes the plugin. Uh, but there are other services such as uh, VPN as a service, uh, firewall as a service that some people actually consider relatively core to OpenStack that are implemented as a Fuel plugin. There's also Fuel plugins for SRIOV support for uh, Mellanox uh, Connect X3 uh, um, HCAs, InfiniBand HCAs. There is a Fuel plugin for Elk, Elasticsearch, uh, Logstash, Kibana. Uh, and so forth. 
And as far as upgrades are concerned, uh, for Mirantis, yes, you can do that. The upgrade process is generally such that suppose you're starting out on Fuel 6.1, apply all the available upgrades. You want to now go uh, updates up to that point. You now want to go to uh, Fuel 7. That's what falls is a little weird. You basically download a, a tarball, an upgrade tarball, which you then need to manually unpack. Then that runs an upgrade shell script, which depending on your hardware will take something like 30 minutes or so. Um, you're going to have uh, brief API outages during the upgrade run, but after the upgrade is done, is done, what it then provides to you is basically the newly released OpenStack version that you can then deploy um, services for. So, uh, so that's the, the brief update story for Mirantis. Okay, I'm afraid I'm out of time. Um, thank you very much for coming. Sorry for the, for the room situation and have a great rest of the conference. Hayo gozaimashita. Arigatou gozaimashita.